2012, like polka dot ocean protocol, the graph near one inch. Richard has previously exited three software companies as an entrepreneur, reaching a cumulative market cap of 2.2 billion. And next to Richard and next to me, we have Min, who is the co-founder and managing partner of Ethereal Ventures, a leading crypto venture firm founded by Min and Joseph Lubin. They have over 40 portfolio companies around the world, including Alio, Eigenlayer, Aztec Protocol, and Spruce ID. So yeah, can we give them a round of applause? Thank you for joining us. Okay, we're gonna dive right in. So um, I thought we could dis uh, start the discussion by discussing the topic itself, crypto capitals. And for our purposes, we can think of capitals in the sense of cities, states, or even countries. The question is, do we need crypto capitals? Um, and maybe we can think about this in terms of um, Men and Richard, your portfolio companies, and Sota, your startups. Does it matter and why? Anyone can go ahead and jump right in. Okay, I can go then. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think in terms of the company and the project, the crypto project is naturally decentralized, right? Uh, we have uh, 60, more than 60 people from 19 different countries, and we have uh, uh, four entities in five regions. So it's fully decentralized. But uh, in terms of the user's perspective, you know, user have to pay tax. And uh, it is always better to you know, clearly define what's okay and what's not. And uh, it's also, you know, in Japan, it's super difficult to monitor all transactions and uh, understand the tax percentage and actually the exchange crypto to fiat and pay tax. So I think rule have to be clearly defined for users and then the project can decide which region to start the project, I think. I would, um, I mean, I echo the, the, that kind of uh, distribution of the different sort of centers of uh, gravity within our uh, portfolio. Um, I think we, um, we're actually backed by the European Investment Fund, and um, you know they naturally want us to encourage activity uh, within the EU 27 plus EFTA and, and so forth. Um, and uh, it, you know it, it's tricky because you know you may have uh, something that's uh, you know, legally instantiated in Switzerland for a foundation uh, that was originally derived from something that was in Berlin, uh, and then folks uh, actually are now in Lisbon a lot because they went there over over lockdown, uh, and then are holidaying in, in, in Ibiza. And then um, I guess you might reflect, I mean, you encourage us to think about it sort of flexibly. Um, if there are crypto capitals, they it could be argued that they're actually kind of Denver and then, you know, Paris for ETCC, um, you know, Singapore, and then Dubai for Token 2049. You know, that's where often the teams meet for the, for the first time. Uh, but, you know, I think it's a very good point about tax from a user perspective. And users are part of these networks actually as right. well, critically. Right. Um, but that's kind of distinct from, I think, um, you know, the projects themselves. So essentially what we're saying is it depends on what we're talking about. Are we talking about yeah. the user? in terms of maybe legality? Are we talking about teams and where they are working out of? Uh, like we were discussing earlier, um, we have, I've talked to quite a few people who have just met their teams for the first time at this conference in over two or three years of working together and shipping really great products. And I'm sure this is not new to anyone. So you know where teams are, maybe could be distributed, doesn't need a capital. Um, any thoughts, Min? Yeah, I think ultimately if you focus a question on like, you know, where are people building cool things, like, you know, which is important because I think smart entrepreneurs either want to build close to their users or they want to build close to other like, you know, talented builders so that they can learn from each other from osmosis. And us and investors, we generally go where the smart builders are, you know, and we just follow along too. So as a result, like because crypto is just inherently very global, you do have the emergence of hubs in every single sort of jurisdiction. I think in, um, in the US, you have New York, Austin, you know, San Francisco, Denver. Um, in Europe, you see pockets in like, you know, London, Berlin, 
Paris and in Asia, definitely, you know, in Singapore, Thailand, Hong Kong, um, and Dubai is also emerging quite quickly too. Um, but to me, I think this, the, you know, the most important crypto capital is still online, like, you know, mm -hmm. ideally on Forecaster. So our online Asian friends can also partake in the discussion. Uh, that's what makes crypto cool. Um, but certainly, you know, there's, um, there's a lot that sort of physical presence can't be replicated. Yeah, no, I'd agree, agree with that. I think um, you want to have those coffee sh shop moments or, or, you know, be able to sort of sit around the kitchen table when you're first getting projects going. Um, and um, I guess I took a decision, actually. Uh, some of my contemporaries of the university actually went to Silicon Valley to go and start building companies, and I took a decision to try and build companies from, uh, from Europe, and, and in particular from London. Um, but, you know, London, there are, I think in Europe in general, um, it's more distributed and decentralized um, than it has been in the US. And we had a sort of thesis around that that was, it kind of stemmed a little bit from the, the, the original city states of mm -hmm. like, you know, say 500 years ago that had very strong um, academic credentials and universities that grew out of it. Um, and that, so therefore, you know, you, you know, we've got London and all the whole stretch from kind of Bristol through Oxford, through multiple universities in London, all the way through to Cambridge, that's exceptionally strong in both AI and FinTech. And then that, you know, obviously supports increasingly strength in, in crypto. Um, but across Europe, everybody embraced open source quite early. Uh, it's, quite, it's hard to sort of fully document, but, you know, Linux, MySQL, they all kind of came from... Uh, from Europe, and we've seen some remarkable successes um, of software companies out of Romania. And so I just met uh, one of our LPs in the lift uh, this morning and told him what we were talking about, and he pointed to uh, a technologist out of Sofia, Bulgaria, who's building a, you know, an exceptionally efficient large language, language model. So I think you know, it can cro crop up everywhere, and we like to encourage that. So it can naturally emerge from what's happening locally, and then it just starts to attract um, and grow from there. Actually, this is a perfect segue into the next part of our question, or the next part of our section is, are, are, we, seeing, are we seeing builders shift towards any particular capital or space or region, maybe more over the last six or 12 months? Um, you've mentioned a couple of you know, places in Europe. I mean, you've mentioned Dubai. Any, any thoughts on where people um, are moving, congregating? Yeah. I I, I live in Singapore right now, and originally from Japan, and I'm traveling a lot. I visited, I think, four or five cities in the last two months. <laughs> so uh, I think a lot of the developer goes to, like, you know, good, friendly environment, like Dubai or maybe Singapore and so on. But I, at the same time, in terms of the capital market, it's obviously led by the U.S., so, but in terms of the adoption, I think a lot of the users are in Asia because let's say NFT or, you know, Gamify and so on. It does not, it does not make sense to earn, let's say, $5 or $3 per hour in the U.S. But it does make sense in Southeast Asia, for example. So it there are a lot of the users. So much more valuable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So developers are located in Europe, I guess, Europe or maybe uh, Dubai. But actually, users are in Asia. And financially speaking, it is led by US. So from the entrepreneurship mindset, it is really important to understand the dynamics of the market and leverage the best part of the country. And I think in terms of sheer numbers, obviously, Asia has some of the largest um, populations who are increasingly or rapidly coming online yeah. and getting familiarized with, with crypto. And we, and, we, and we made the point earlier um, as well made that obviously, you know, users need to know where they're going to get sort of taxed. Um, but underneath that, um, as a group, when we were preparing, I think we reached a consensus. We didn't particularly want to talk about uh, regulation because um, the topic comes skip up ahead to regulation. <laughs> time and again. Um, but I, you asked where we could see a kind of, um, should we say, a surge of activity um, and, you know, we definitely have seen um, people getting a little bit frustrated with the uncertainty that exists within the U.S. And a, a lot of people are doing good work to, to resolve that, but there's, it seems obviously can, to still be very, fairly politicized. Um, and um, whereas in Europe there are some regulations that have got, given sufficient clarity 
um, in general, you know, Mika being one, but and then jurisdictions that can s comfortably support, you know, kind of neutral entities like foundations, in particular, uh, you know, Switzerland, that I think has encouraged people to, to build there, which has been um, great. And I think there's a lot of clarity in Dubai that's already been mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've been drawn into a whole series of conversations uh, in Dubai uh, and uh, other places in the in the region. Um, so I, I think, and then we've seen obviously it's famously A16Z Crypto has both opened an office in London, in London. and started a crypto startup school in London. We welcome them just as they've been welcomed by um, uh, the, the UK government. Um, it's an unexpected result of Brexit in some senses. <laughs> um, um, and, that's, and that's good, and that, that's a reflection, I think, of everything I just said about the, the frustration. Um, but I think, um, and we were also talking about this a little bit earlier, it's going to become, if we were to get a point to how it should work, is that we should have uh, builders get together, work out how regulation can be addressed from the bottom up on an emergent basis through innovations you know, around uh, individuals and how they attest to their, their status. Um, and that's going to be increasingly necessary in this sort of multi-layered cake of, of you know, abstraction that is being built. Um, uh, where you know you you know one particular DAP may sort of hop between mul multiple different chains, uh, and that may of course even be dynamic. And how are you going to how's that going to be regulated from the top down? It's an impossible task. So I think it's a, a, a call to, to builders to try and get regulation or kind of uh, find ways of making sure that we're comfortable with the way that criminality can be managed from the bottom up. So just on that, I I mean. So we're talking now a little bit more around regulation and how that could work. I mean, we've had so many conversations over the past week in terms of new technological developments that have been happening. We've talked about account abstraction, chain abstraction, modularity. Um, if builders were to participate in a ground up, you know, um, how things should be set up regulatory, in, in, in regulation, how would they even begin? Could they even think about it? How would they even think about it? Well, hopefully they won't have to think about it. I mean, uh, hopefully this is something that it, it can be in, for, in the spirit of this sort of open, permissionless, you know, immutable code as law, you know, movement. It's something that, you know, if you're using the systems, uh, you will be able to prove that to anybody who cares in the network that you are who you are, you say you are. Um, that um, there's, n there's not something that your kind of counterparty needs to know about you before you transact. Um, it's not know your customer or business, it's know your transaction. Um, right. and, the, and that um, you know, even stuff like source of funds and, and so forth can be, you can, be, you can get comfortable with it, which can ha happen at a, effectively at a protocol level. And so we need the builders to innovate to build that. Um, and maybe the regulators to understand this is a new paradigm. Right. Um, any thoughts on how, I mean, the two could come together because, you know, so this year is, is quite an important year for crypto in terms of elections. We're seeing general elections happen in major capitals around the world. So in the U.S., obviously, in the European Union, Indonesia, Pakistan, India, U.K., um, potentially. How do we have these two different parts, the, the whole emergence of all these new technologies happening rapidly and then governments trying to figure out what's going on in the space and then trying to provide a layer of guidance, guidelines for things to actually for flourish, for things to actually move forward. Um, so that we were talking earlier about how um, entrepreneurs can only um, take risks when there is clarity. Yeah. Yeah. And so... Without clarity, it's almost like, how do we move forward? And I had lots of these conversations in Europe before Micah yeah. came about, and it was almost like a standstill. So any thoughts on, yeah. maybe even from a Japanese perspective, what the government is doing? Yeah, um, I, I would like to share the Japanese perspective. I think the first, things, first most important thing is the regulators are not our enemy. And the worst case is the regulator define crypto law without knowing crypto. This is the worst case. So we have to speak with them. And regulator has a lot of the task to define, right? So we have to get their mind share. And from the Japanese perspective, 
we lo completely lost in Web2. We don't have a global Web2 company, but Japan is used to be number one in terms of the growth of the economy. And then we have a global company such as Toyota, Sony, and so on. And if we miss Web3, we may lose another 20 years. This is a narrative we are using right now. And then the government understand Web3 is coming, and they also understand they have to invest in Web3 because they missed Web2, and our mm -hmm. economy is not growing. Uh, this is the kind of narrative everybody agree on. So that's why it's easier for us to speak with them. And the Japanese government made Web3 as a national strategy uh, two years ago, and they already changed two or three crypto tax on unrealized gain and uh, uh, tax on companies, so which is also a good move. Um, and I think if, and the good thing is because Japanese government clearly defined what's okay and not, and made Web3 a national strategy, big company enter to the market. So for, for, for example, in our case, we got the seed investment from Sony, so we capitally aligned, and we created a joint venture together with Sony, and we are going to deploy public blockchain together with Sony uh, in coming months. We are kind of stealth mode right now, but once we launch the chain, I think this is gonna be one of the biggest project in the world, I believe. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I think maybe it's, it's lesser known right now what the Japanese government is doing, yeah. but I know the Prime Minister is very, very involved in yeah. what's happening in Web3, so maybe it's one that you know, everyone could pay a little bit more attention to. Yep. I think we can move on to some interesting topics, thinking about the future and trends. So I think one thing that investors and you know, public relations have in common is that we often get a glimpse of what we're going to see in the news headlines, but six months earlier. You guys are in rooms with entrepreneurs who are developing very new technologies. So take us into these you know, smoke-filled rooms. What kind of new trends do you think we're going to see in the headlines in six months? And are they emerging from any particular capitals? Um, I think on that front, especially as it relates to adoption, um, we're personally really very excited about like the advent of stablecoin payments. I think we now recognize that stablecoin is a preferred mode of transaction between people and it's super useful as a transport mechanism, also a sec settlement mechanism for admittances and cross-border payments. Um, certainly I think like, you know, not just in um, areas like, you know, LATAM or Southeast Asia, but also in Africa, we're starting to see a, a lot of adoption there. And a lot of amazing builders there also building startups that are sort of next generation payments, a continuation from the fintech kind of, you know, micropayments, lending, neobanks that we saw. Um, and I think that's really going to take center stage and highlight how stable coins can actually permeate people's lives on an everyday basis and provide real utility. I will start off by echoing that, Tilly. We, we did a little a panel with folks from you know, PayPal and uh, Circle and, Sol and, and Solana and Ledger on stable coins, and we have uh, folks like um, uh, Dew and, and uh, you know, Nilos and um, uh, about a dozen different payments-related uh, companies in our portfolio, and we've seen um, really great success from Cosmos, uh, which is a, uh, you know, a very well adopted, arguably one of the most well adopted dApps running in the near ecosystem, which has uh, got a bunch of interesting things converging within it actually to sort of get onto um, to, to your question. Um, it's got a, elements of sort of social co commerce and, and loyalty and so forth baked, baked into it, uh, which we see, have seen as being particularly strong uh, coming out of um, Asia. Um, and there our thesis is a little bit about. Um, People call it different things, you know, people as the platform, headless or leaders, leaderless sort of um, uh, marketplaces or networks um, where you get this intersection of, of, you know, DeFi and Web3 social to kind of, you know, people can aggregate around, you know, something they believe in and then tra and transact around. Um, so it's that combined with, uh, to kind of, to make it into a strap line the ability to outstrip Stripe uh, in terms of embedded low cost, you know, kind of uh, payments, on, you know, using stable coins. And then um, also combining actually something that um, we think builds on some of the strength across uh, Europe. And we've seen, you know, Mistral obviously in France and 
as I mentioned, the AI strength uh, in, in the UK, uh, and that is the, um, the extremely popular topic of AI X crypto, uh, the uh, popular mm -hmm. at least um, certainly here in uh, the conversations. Not, I don't think, the smoke-filled rooms uh, here in <laughs> East Denver. That's not really been the vibe. T -t coffee, I would say more. More um, coffee. Um, and I was pleased to, pleased to read, by the way, of a, there's a nutritional uh, outfit that uses AI called Zoe in the UK, and, I, and the, the founder posted today that uh, he, he used to not drink coffee, and now he's drinking coffee because the research is telling him that it's actually good for you in a number of ways. I was overjoyed to, to read that this morning, over actually. And that. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but I think the, that we're beginning to see in those kind of dApps um, the movement, a really fundamental movement, which is going to be um, a convergence of the capability, the AI capabilities, so should we think of it as an LLM operating system with a kind of blockchain operating system, uh, some folks calling it a sort of sovereign operating system, uh, which ultimately will deliver, you know, contextual application experiences to you that don't require apps and therefore don't require app stores in the same way. Um, so that's, you know, it doesn't take um, a genius to work out that if you're uh, taking out the 30% rake that, that exists or take that exists in the app store and circumventing um, Apple in different ways, that that's a, it's a fundamental shift. So how would users industry. access them? Uh, well, it's open permissionless systems that, that, that you're, um, you'll have multiple devices that understand uh, both your personal context, because you've shared, you know, they know your identity, they know some of the history of what you've purchased, your loyalty, all of the different tribes and DAOs that you belong to, uh, what used to be known in the sort of Facebook sense as your kind of interest graph, uh, but now maybe you've, it's easy to share it and it's going to be um, token attested uh, through your, you know, your travels. Um, and then also understanding your precise, you know, I'm, I'm here in Denver, I'm, you know, up here in, on, you know, in the radio center, um, and it will work out what it is that you need. What do you want to hear about? It will work out maybe even if, if it's allowed to know that, um, who you're talking to. Um, and so the point is that the concept of an app um, doesn't it's really become exist outdated. anymore. Yeah, it's just a continually personalized experience, almost, almost in a sense of a stream to you. And so, but that's a... It's a fundamental shift, but I don't think it's very far away. There's the rabbit badge you probably might have seen la launched that I, you know, I, I know nothing about other than what one has seen through the launch um, that is starting to kind of deliver on some of that. Uh, but I think it will, you know, lots of different devices around your person will collaborate in order to, to deliver what you need. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, uh, for me, I would like to see uh, mass adoption. So our mission is Web3 for billion. Right. And uh, I would like to make the world where people are using Web3 in a daily life, just like internet of today. And to do so, I think leveraging the existing business is easier than collecting, getting the user from scratch. So I personally would like to see more enterprise adoption to leveraging existing business. I mean, integrating Web3 protocol, decentralized technology into existing business. How do you think those conversations are going? I mean, they're also, I guess, trying to wrap their heads around how all of this works. We are yeah. trying to wrap our heads around how, how all of this works. Um, have you seen any of these conversations happen yeah. and how the movements are going? Yeah, I'm a big Web3 believer. So I think protocol have to be decentralized, but in terms of the interface, in terms of the user or maybe corporate strategy, it can be centralized. The community and that protocol are different. And we have been working with Sony, so you know, uh, in, it is, they think it is not possible to compete with, let's say, Google or maybe Facebook by making centralized platform. So it is better for the Japanese company to create more demo demographic, de you know, the platform which can be Web3. So they are still looking for the you know possibilities, but I hope we can convince them to make it happen. I totally support that. Um, we have some experience in um, the enthusiasm around sort of, uh, there's a, an event called CellGP that uh, NIR has sponsored to try and create a new relationship between the athletes and the fans in there. Um, I think, and, and we also see it around uh, 
the ICC, International Cricket Council, um, and then a whole, a whole series of um, other support sports um, that one could tap into. And obviously, sports has become an increasingly well commercialized and very lucrative um, you know, business. Uh, it's attracted the attention of private equities, a different kind of part of the kind of ecosystem, <clears throat> and buying them up and backing them. But I think, you know, exactly as just described, um, there's an opportunity to get away from today's platforms. Like if you want to create a relationship between the athletes and the fans, you don't have to do that on Instagram or do that on Twitter or do that. Sure. You, can, you can create your own community through, web, you know, through technologies and one that is much more potent, um, you know, both in terms of the long tail, but also in terms of how you can serve the, the, the classic thousand true fans if you've read that post. Um, so I think that's another really exciting kind of frontier. Well, we've just got a couple of minutes left. I thought, you know, since we've not talked about the US that much, yeah. we're sitting <laughs> talking about the rest of the world here. Um, in terms of the conversations you guys are having with your portfolio companies and so are like your own plans and other builders that you work with, where do you see US placed on the short and midterm plans? So I think from our perspective and Disclosure, you know, more, more than half of our portfolio is U.S. based. I think we talk a lot about adoption happening in the East, and that might be true in terms of numbers, like, you know, in terms of, like, DAUs and MAUs, but the spend is definitely the highest in the, U in the U.S. still. It's probably 10x higher um, than what you see in Asia, for example. So it continues to be a really important uh, market, and I think, you know, we've encouraged our portfolio companies to continue engaging U.S. users, um, you know, I think for certainly like depending on the type of protocol or mm -hmm. business that you're building, um, we've seen, say, some founders who are building more trading or like centralized exchange type projects, like move out to Asia, move out to Dubai, where they have a little bit more clarity and they have the ability to get licensed and operate in a regulated way. Um, or if you're building a protocol, maybe moving to Europe because, you know, they feel um, like there's a little bit more protection if they're like, you know, with the sort of foundation model there as well. Um, but certainly I think the U.S. is front and center, one of the key markets in crypto. And we also see it in New York that's uh, become such like a hotbed for great talent and great founders who build good teams and they get together mm -hmm. very often. So lots of great osmosis there. Yeah, I think we don't have much time. So to make the long story short, I think money and talent, the U.S. is going to lead, but the adoption, Asia is going to lead. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, we invest globally, so we see projects around the world, but about two thirds in uh, in Europe. Um, I think it'll continue to be very distributed and, and, and borderless. Um, I think if I was to um, try and prompt people in Europe to um, further propel that ecosystem, the main challenge over there is actually um, LPs to back venture firms. Um, and so, you know, I, we can't argue with the strength of the funding profile within the, the US. Sure. Um, so <clears throat> LPs. LPs assemble. Great. Um, well, that's the end of our conversation for this morning. Um, if you want to reach any of the panelists, um, feel free to find them on Sosota on Twitter. You can find him at W-A-T-A-N-A-B-E Sota. Watanabe, I think. Soba, uh, so Sota. And then Richard, um, uh, his full name as well on 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 link, uh, sorry on Twitter. That's Richard Muir, Muirhead. Yes, and and Min on on Twitter as well underscore Mintio, and I'm on Twitter as well. Deborah Nita twenty eight. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Hello. Hello.